In the late 90s, world leaders gathered in Kyoto, Japan for the third ever UN COP event, aimed at addressing climate change. Global demand for energy is going to soar in the decades to come. It was at that conference where the frameworks were set for the first carbon trading market. It was an attempt to address an externality in the economic system, the environmental impact of massive amounts of carbon released into the atmosphere. The agreement strongly reflects the commitment of the United States to use the tools of the free market to tackle this problem. Less than a decade later, the first compliance carbon market was launched. It required certain industries to limit carbon output, either by reducing their emissions or by purchasing carbon permits on a regulated market. Those that reduced their carbon could sell it back into the market. Since then, carbon trading markets have popped up around the world, and economists and environmentalists are still weighing their impact. So this week, we're diving into carbon markets. It's what we do here on Reuters Econ World. Every week, we pick a phrase or buzzword and go deep on the economic principles and ideas driving the biggest news around the world. I'm your host, Christopher Waljasper, in Chicago. Joining me today to explain how these markets operate, as well as their impact on the climate, are Nina Chesney and Jake Spring. Nina is our deputy editor of Energy and Commodities based in London and has been covering carbon markets since 2007. Jake Spring is a climate reporter based in Brasilia. He's covered climate and the environment since 2017, including the United Nations' attempts to address climate change. Nina, uh, let's start with some basics. Can you uh, walk us through how these markets work? Yeah, I mean, I'd say that the emissions trading schemes, are, they're limited to one country or a group of countries in terms of the EU. Under those, the governments tend to allocate or auction off a quota of carbon permits to industrial companies, so cement, steel, that kind of heavy industry, power companies, and also sometimes the aviation sector, up to a certain limit. And each carbon permit is usually worth a ton of carbon dioxide. So if the companies involved that are regulated by those markets need more permits to cover their emissions. They can buy more on an exchange or through regular auctions. If they don't need as many as their quota allows, they can sell them for profit on exchanges. Outside that, there's also Chinese market, California, Britain, and other parts of America. And they have functioning um, missions trading schemes, as well as other parts of the world. The voluntary markets are different in that, the, you know, it, it's kind of global, right? They're sometimes known as offsetting, and they enable emitters to offset their unavoidable emissions by buying credits from low-carbon projects, and they could be anywhere in the world, right? So, for example, Shell could decide to offset some of its oil emissions or something from a forestry project in a totally different part of the world. Each credit, again, is usually one ton of CO2. And they can also be bought by individuals if you want to offset your airline emissions when you go on a flight, for example. Jake, what do these markets look like uh, in practice? So in Brazil, we see a lot of projects where people plant forests or allow forests to regrow, they regenerate the Amazon, for example. A bunch of smallholder farmers that otherwise would want to grow crops on their land would instead be incentivized to, to plant trees and allow them to regrow. And often this can have the backing of a fund or a financial backer working with maybe an NGO. They, they plant the trees and then over 30 years, these trees sequester carbon. And every ton of carbon sequestered by these trees, they then get to sell as carbon credits. So again, it like incentivizes them to plant forest rather than to chop it down, keep it as crops. And, and you look at the carbon credit retirements and you see things like Netflix series buying credits in Brazil to offset the emissions from their production and, and interesting things like that. I mean, companies like Boeing or BCG. So companies internationally are buying these credits 
Okay, so we have compliance markets in specific places like the EU or China or California, but then there's also these voluntary markets. Uh, how do the two types of markets compare in terms of volume? I mean, the, the global carbon market, if we take all of the compliance markets, was $950 billion US dollars last year. But I mean, the European Union scheme took the bulk of the share of that. I think it was nearly 90% of the global carbon market size. As Nina said, like the voluntary market, it got up to 2 billion. And then last year, it cratered to 700 million. So, I mean, the compliance market is just so much larger. I don't even know how many times larger that is, a thousand times. <laughs> it's giant in comparison. And as things stand at the moment, there's no one global carbon market. Right. And that's something that the UN has been grappling with for as long as I've been covering carbon markets and energy markets uh, since 2007. Right. But little progress has been made towards linking the different schemes. There's different prices of carbon, there are different designs to the schemes or even the sectors covered. Mm -hmm. So there's no trading of carbon permits between, say, the EU and China, right, in their compliance markets. Hmm. Yeah. And at the end of the day, emissions in one part of the world uh, inevitably could affect the climate or health outcomes in another part of the world. So uh, let's get down to it. Uh, these markets were created as a sort of economic solution to an environmental problem. Are they having an impact on the climate, uh, on reducing emissions? I mean, if we take the European Union's emissions trading system in 2020, when COVID hit, emissions covered by that scheme fell by 11% compared to the year before. That was the largest drop since the scheme began. But obviously, that was a bit of a erroneous year in so many ways, but also for you know energy demand was down travel was down. So that, that was a bit of an anomaly. However, last year, the scheme's emissions fell by nearly 16% compared to 2022 levels. So the EU Commission hails this as a success, um, showing that this is their cornerstone tool, I think is the phrase they often use, towards meeting their emissions targets and fighting climate change. Yeah. There's a uniqueness of this market, right? Where the product that is being traded is a reduction of carbon. It's not a widget. It's not a commodity. It, does that somehow open up these markets to uh, manipulation or even unintended incentives? Well, I mean, the EU ETS has suffered in the early days from quite a few issues. The main one was due to design flaws when too many permits were issued. Hmm. And at that time, many of them were issued for free. So they were just given out. And that created a flood of them in the market and caused the price to massively drop. And obviously, a higher price of carbon is ultimately the way to incentivize companies to switch to renewable fuels or not emit as much. So that was quite a, a problem. There were all sorts of other kind of scams in the market. So that required quite a lot of redesign of the market and reform to it. But we've not seen any of that quite some time. Obviously, voluntary markets are a different kettle of fish. I think one of the main issues around voluntary markets is standardization and verifying and knowing that the low carbon project, which you are getting an carbon offset from is actually doing something to lower emissions. But there isn't one standard that encompasses everything. Like you said, the, the issue in the voluntary market is it's a reduction of something. And you have to, a lot of it relies on this very hypothetical math in which you say, okay, emissions would have been this high. And because of what I'm doing, they're going to be X number of tons lower. You see this particularly in forestry where they overinflate how much deforestation there would have been in an area. And they say, well, look at our project. There's no deforestation here. So it's this huge gap. 
So how do these examples of of projects not living up to their promises uh, affect the broader carbon trading market? So there's kind of a reputational risk, and and you have seen companies kind of take a step back from this market, and that's why the value of transactions cratered so much last year, because companies don't want to be associated with a project that later gets found out for fudging the numbers or even criminal wrongdoing. But so in a way, it, this isn't like a commodity market, right? A, a buyer of wheat futures doesn't worry about the quality of the product behind that purchase. But in the voluntary carbon market, it's a little bit buyer beware. Companies need to vet these projects so that they have some trust in the actual carbon reduction. For sure, yeah. And you've definitely seen big companies kind of flee to what is deemed as high quality credits, which are instead of reducing deforestation, for example, it's planting trees because that's just more concrete and tangible. You're not working with a made up baseline. You're working with, you know, an actual tree that's growing. And you've seen companies like Microsoft and the other big tech companies going to like BTG Pactual, which is a big investment bank's forestry arms and buying credits from them because they're seen as kind of blue chip, high quality standard. And maybe some they're staying away from more questionable projects by smaller outfits. Now, as Jake mentioned, carbon credit programs can take many forms. One approach that's gained popularity is efforts to replace cook stoves in homes in developing parts of Africa and other parts of the world where rudimentary stoves burn dirty fuels, endangering the health of families using them. Several companies have begun manufacturing and distributing cook stoves that use wood, cleaner burning fuels, or even electricity including a Kenya-based company called Burn. The company not only manufactures the stoves, it provides in-home training. Senior carbon manager Natasha Kalanda Otolo explains that this helps ensure the stoves are actually reducing carbon emissions. And we have legitimate credits. We don't have fake credits, meaning the process to get to where we have sold a stove to an actual household, and we have followed up with that household to make sure they see the impact. We are not telling them. Carbon credits are at the core of Burns' business model, says Chris McKinney, Burns' chief commercial officer. Finding ways to fill that uh, gap for between the actual cost to deliver that stove and the willingness to pay or the ability to pay for the mass market. Um, so what, how we do that is through carbon financing. Uh, and the use of carbon credits. But some environmental advocates like Amos Wamena, a senior advisor at PowerShift Africa, say that solutions like this are actually masking climate emissions rather than solving the problem. Emissions, when they should be stopping those destructive activities that they are doing, they are shifting this to victims, to developing countries, and continuing to pollute. So this Africa accounts for just 2 to 3 percent of the world's carbon dioxide emissions from energy and industrial sources, according to the UN Climate Change Conference. In the examples we've discussed, uh, they're all uh, points in time. How do we know that these carbon reduction efforts are going to have a lasting impact? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. It's what people in the market call the issue of permanency. It's definitely an issue when it comes to forests could grow for 25 years and burn down. It could never burn down. But specifically forest fires, the risk is increasing and increasing. And, you know, at least in the voluntary market, they have this kind of insurance scheme called buffer pools where you set aside some of your credits in case of a fire and everybody pools together. So if one project burns down, that pool of all the projects can help to pay for what was burnt down. Still, I mean, there are, there are critics who argue that the permanent issues aren't solved in, in, in forestry. How are these carbon trading markets viewed? In the climate change community, are folks whose main focus is emissions reduction and addressing climate change? A lot of environmentalists don't like carbon credits because they see it as a way for a company to kind of buy its way out of its emissions. So they emit whatever, 100 million tons of carbon, they can just buy 100 million credits. Now, companies aren't, aren't doing that 100%, but that's the fear, at least, that they could be doing 
more and instead they're perhaps buying carbon credits. So some people blast them. They say they shouldn't exist at all. I mean, I think within like UN d- discussion, a lot of diplomats still really believe in this and they really think, well, rich countries need a mechanism to pay for poor countries to sequester carbon. And this is the mechanism. And it's always held that kind of pr- unrealized promise that there could be this international market. And they're still trying in the voluntary market. And, you know, some people think, you know, we just have to set it up right and it will be great for the world. So I think there's kind of a, a, a big divide on it. And Nina, you've mentioned that compliance markets only cover specific industries at this point. Are there plans to expand? In the case of the European scheme, the EU obviously wants to expand further as well to include other sectors which haven't been included as of yet. But most of the other schemes that I'm aware of, it's mostly covering the big industry Mm. and utilities. But, you know, we've got huge transport sector. Um, There's lots of other sectors that emit. So it's obviously not covering 100% of what the EU emits in one year, say. It's, It's quite a fair proportion, but it's definitely not all of it. So what do we know about the future of these markets? Well, as Susanna Twydale on my team um, does a regular poll of analysts on where they expect EU carbon prices to be, right, in the next few years, the latest one expects carbon permit prices to soar by 2027. The European Commission expects to reduce its net greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030. And they have a mechanism built into the EU ETS to remove what they call surplus permits from the market. And so that's why they're expecting the amount of permits available to shrink by 2027. So if the emitters under the scheme want permits, there's going to be a smaller amount for them to go for. And so therefore, as in any commodity market, when there's less supply, prices tend to go up. Mm -hmm. A higher carbon price, though, should incentivize people not to emit as much. Yeah. So to use other fuels or other renewable energy sources, that's basically what the carbon market is supposed to achieve. So the discussions at the UN that are coming up in November, they're going to look to settle rules on carbon credits to try to launch this global multilateral system for for trading carbon credits to kind of link up markets and could maybe legitimize projects that before were in the voluntary carpet market could maybe comply with the UN rules and, and be traded internationally that way. But there have been attempts to do this, this in the past. They kind of failed. There was the Kyoto Protocol and that flooded the market with credits and they ended up being not worth very much and it didn't really work. So there's a sense that they've really got to get it right this time because this might be the last chance to actually set up a global market before we've completely blown all of our climate targets. Thanks to everyone for listening to this week's episode. A big thank you to Nina Chesney and Jake Spring, as well as everyone who covers economics and climate here at Reuters. You can read their great work on Reuters.com or the Reuters app. Carmel will be back next week. Sound design, music composition, and engineering for Econ World was by the ever-talented Josh Summer. Our podcast team includes Kim Vanell, Gail Issa, Jonah Green, David Spencer, Sharon Reichgarsen, and me, Christopher Waljasper. Our senior producers are Carmel Crimmins and Tara Oaks. Our executive producer is Leela DeKretzer. Remember, for all your daily news, check out our weekday show, Reuters World News. You can catch it on the Reuters app or wherever you listen to podcasts. Podcasts.